to adapt the musical Les Mis for film. We don't need to be in a black box. We give you the world. We give you the mountains of France. We give you the, the docks where Valjean works. You see the full scale of Paris uh, in all its majesty and a whole world of meaning and emotion opens up. It is a musical. It is emotional. It's not a documentary of a revolutionary period in French history. I felt visually that I would have to support that emotion and the narrative and bring that world to life. When I read the script, the challenges were to be able to bring something that's so iconic on stage onto film. We've tried to keep to reality, but then with a sort of slight slant to it as well, so that there is a sort of element of magic and sort of a dream quality. challenges in building lovely ladies, the, the damp and the cold and the stink. It's like finding enough seaweed to staple onto the walls. We had to get it shipped down from Scotland. You know, I remember when the lovely lady said it was just kind of molded plastic in the shape of bricks. And then it became like bricks. You would look at them and you would never doubt it. In the streets of Paris it took a team of about 100 carpenters, plasterers, sculptors and painters probably brought that figure up to near 200. One of the biggest challenges, really interestingly, was trying to get like amazing carpenters not to build things with straight lines. That's been my hardest challenge. You suddenly, you feel for a moment, where am I? It is so credible that you are in 19th century Paris street. For a British actor, working in Pinewood is always part of the dream, but to work on a set of that scale, I mean, is absolutely beautiful. The cafe, partly inspired by, you know, the Flatiron building in New York. This is a building that, as you can see, is you know, about to fall down on the right-hand side and, and has a kind of insubstantiality to it. The finale is about the final revolution in Paris of 1848. The barricade was spread over 100 feet and was upwards of 20-odd feet high. I think what I was trying to achieve was a combination of extreme realism so that the film would feel rooted in a, in a visceral reality, but also allowing a certain heightening of reality. I thought Eve outdid herself with the sets. I think it's going to be an incredibly uh, astonishing film to look at. Les Miserables is so well loved by so many people all over the world. We really felt that we wanted to make the reality believable and bring it to life. The whole story is monumental. I mean, we're starting 1815 and we're finishing 1848. We are dressing nearly 4,000 people. We have made prostitutes, we have made poor, we have made rich. Jean Baljan is the person that starts in a kind of really, really rough situation. Little by little, he starts getting more sophisticated. Tom was always like quite interested in how could you portray an image of sanctity in a way, you know, like a person who has made a journey to become a better person in his life, you know, in every sense. Fantine is a really interesting character. We start at the beginning, I think, like a girl that really takes care of herself, and then we end up portraying her as a prostitute in a really harsh red color that is the same color that we see at the beginning, that is the color of the convicts in the movie. There was a real uh, aversion to doing anything glamorous. Things could be beautiful, but they had to be real. We are filming today lovely ladies. We have like a lot of lovely prostitutes with a lot of color. Looking at the research, we just discovered at that period, it was a lot of women that had almost like nearly transparent dresses in a lot of color. 
is a story here that looks like a mirror somehow, and it is Cosette and Eponin. And Cosette, when she's a child, she's a really kind of like raggedy girl, and she's working as a, you know, as a servant in Eponin's parents' house. Eponin is like this kind of like dolly kind of figure, and 10 years later, it's completely the opposite. Gabrosh's character is based in a reality. I was very shocked to discover that, in fact, in the streets of Paris at this time, there were thousands of little boys and little girls just living by themselves in the streets. You know, he's very little, but at the same time, he's very wise. That's what we wanted to create with him. The Tenardiers are like the color of the movie, really. Sasha Baron Cohen is a great actor and comedian, and Helena Bonacarte as well. They were trying to bring their personality somehow into the movie. I think because this is a, this is a musical and it's an unreal situation in life, we had to put some kind of fantasy into it. That's really my job, I think, you know, to create a character with all those ingredients. When I read the novel of Les Miserables, I felt the one thing missing from the musical was the acknowledgement of how central falling in love with little Cosette was to Jean Valjean and what it's like to become a father in an unexpected way. Suddenly, you're here. Suddenly, it starts. There is a chapter in the book that I think only a camera can catch. Cosette is taken away from the Thenardiers. And there is a broken child who's never known love. And there is Jean Valjean who's never known love. And he realized that he started to feel something for this little girl. Suddenly the world seems... It's a feeling he never had before. Somehow full of grace, full of light. And suddenly what Tom was suggesting made serious sense. On stage, it's very difficult to catch the intimacy of this moment. So this was a unique opportunity for us to add one or two wonderful cinematic moments. We knew it had to be very simple. One day Herbie came up with this wonderfully simple title, Suddenly, and from there the song was born. I'm so afraid of failing you. The first day that Hugh Jackman did the song, it was a beautiful day. Beautiful day. There are shadows everywhere and memories I cannot share. I was in a room with probably the most famous people in the theatre world, Claude Michel and Alain and Cameron McIntosh, have created a song and this is the first time I'm singing back to them. I felt unbelievably blessed in that moment. And everyone went, my God, it seems like it's been composed at the same time than the other songs were composed for this musical. Suddenly I see what I could not see. Something suddenly has been gone. Lisa Westcott's great um, achievement, I think, was the, the journey of Jean Valjean. And somehow she manages to pull off this extraordinary journey for Hugh, where, where you really feel that he's lived a very long and tiring life. The first time we see him, he's a convict and in a very bad state. His head's been scarred for many years, so it's just being hacked off by jailers. He's got this very long, straggly beard, which we um, extended. We just made him very, very decrepit and tired and filthy. Contact lens is made to make him look very sore in the eyes. And then we had some teeth made, some slips that went over his own teeth. Very, very thin, they just clipped in. Tom was so, so worried about teeth, uh, and quite rightly, because, um, you know, you've got a big close-up on an artist um, and they're holding a note and you're seeing right into their mouth. Life was 
worth living. How can you make a beautiful woman not look beautiful? It's kind of tricky, isn't it? Annie Hathaway had the idea that she wanted to get her hair cut for real in the lovely lady scene, which I was amazed at, and we tried, you know, we even tried to talk her out of it. So there's Anne with her hair now cut all chopped off. When she first becomes a prostitute, looking very, very sad and tragic. We had to somehow get rid of her teeth. A lot of people had to wear plastic molds on top of their teeth that had been painted. I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't have to wear it. I was just able to paint my own teeth. It did look great on camera. It looked like a bloody mess. My template really for the horse was a very, very crude makeup that's been on for a long time. You know, that kind of really kind of all running into each other, you know, that really smear. I said to the girls, just go for that kind of look. So it's really, really lumpy and bumpy, and it's got to really tell the story, it's got to be brutal. Everybody raise your glass! Tenardier is a kind of a bit of a light spot, a bit of comedy relief, really, so we can have a bit of fun with them. They're basically con artists, and every time you see them in every situation, through the years, through the, through the story, they look different, um, in, in a different disguise. Sasha really fancied having a gold tooth, so we ended up, uh, the, the final um, configuration of his gold tooth was this little fella, and really earned its living. This wig, um, has got black roots and it's all been um, had different colours of, of blonde in it and been dipped in tea and coffee and all sorts of stuff like that to give it some kind of brassiness and lots of character. The two of them together, it ju they just looked divine. The question you have to ask yourself, or I have to ask myself, which I do continually, and it's just very, very simple, is can you believe it? I dreamed a dream in time gone Life worth living. I dreamed that love would never die. I dreamed that God would be forgiving. But the tigers come at night with their voices so Thunder. I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell I'm living, so different now from what it seemed. Oh, life has killed a dream. It's going to be different, for sure. This is the first time anyone's ever tried it like this. Every single person has seen every take live. This has not been done with this kind of consistency in a musical before. The idea of singing live is daunting, but what it gives you is this freedom. We have found an amazing group of actors who are completely at home acting through music. And the only way you can make that work is by capturing in the moment. Normally, if you were making an old-school movie musical, as a group of actors, we'd go into a studio, we'd record an album, and then two months later, we'd arrive on set, and they would play the playback, and we would mime alongside it. The problem with that is that you have to make all your acting choices three months before you've even met the actor you're working with. By recording it live, Tom is allowing us the spontaneity of normal film acting. You can tell in your bones there's something false or unreal about people singing to playback. What will be exciting for the audience is that singing live has such a profound effect on the, the power and the realism of this story. Big hammer. I do the soliloquy and it starts with, What have I done, sweet Jesus, what have I done? Become a thief in the night, become a dog on the run. Have I fallen so far and is the hour so late that nothing remains but the cry of my hate? Okay, so that's if you were singing it literally, be like that. I can go out there and some takes, I'd, I'd be like, what have I done? Sweet Jesus, what have I done? Become a thief in the, in the night. night, become a dog on the run. Have I fallen so far into the hours so late that nothing remains but the cry of my hate? I can take a little break, I can move on, I can speed it up, I can slow it down, which means I just have to worry about acting. 
I missed it 20 long years ago. The actors have hidden earpieces, and we have a pianist who is playing live into the actors' earpieces, and the actors are setting the tempo rather than a pre-record music track. There's a way for us. I love him. The plan the night is over. Ultimately, the piano will be replaced by a 70-piece orchestra. I love him. Everything has to be completely natural. So a lot of us are stripping it right back so that you can just live it a lot more. There are so many questions and answers that somehow seem wrong. It's so much more powerful. You have complete freedom, complete control. When you're doing a love scene as an actor, you just wish there was music to kind of help you get there. But now you hear the piano in your ears. Now you're, you are of the music and it almost can make you cry. Causes, causes. This is a change. What comes with this way of working is you get the fragility of a voice which matches with the emotions of what a character's saying. And hope was high and life worth living. When I saw the trailer and Anne singing with this extraordinary fragility, that song which I thought I knew pretty well, suddenly I listened to the lyrics for the first time afresh. There seemed to be something selfish about trying to go for the pretty version. But the tigers come at me. She's devastated. She's literally at the bottom of a hole looking up and realizing she's never going to climb out of this. So I just decided to apply the truth to the melody and then see what would happen. For something like Les Miserables, it has to feel real, it has to feel immediate. There's an emotional level to this that just cannot be created in the studio. I thought it was an amazing opportunity to do something genuinely groundbreaking.